I've always, all my life, I've really enjoyed strange places. You know, like to be somewhere that's really unfamiliar has always been a big stimulation for me. Like I, I seek that out. And I think from an early age, I was attracted to that. So, you know, coming in, uh, waking up the first morning, I was in London in a hotel near Russell Square and finding out the right bus to take and going down in a double-decker bus, you know, sitting at the top of the bus and looking down in the crowds and, you know, buying my little ticket with a little rolling ticket machine, you know. I just was so enjoying myself. You know, I just thought this was all great. And the more differences I discovered, the way people talked, the way people acted, everything was just a joy for me. Um, the things that I remember being struck by in my first, you know, year or two that I was in Britain, one was clothing. Mm -hmm. And that was, it took a little getting used to because in America, if you were in the counterculture, if you were in the folk scene, if you were a dope smoker, if you were a music buff, if you were, you know, a blues fan, if you were whatever, it wasn't, it wasn't quite as tribal as Britain was. But generally, the uniform of youth and rebellion was blue jeans. Yeah. That was it. That was it. Work shirt, blue jeans. Um, maybe you grew your hair a bit long. But that was it. You know, it was nobody put a lot of effort into dressing up. And I remember when I was here with the blues tour in the spring of 64. And um, there was we had a night off in London, and this guy who ran a little blues and folk club in Soho came to the hotel, and he sort of lured Brownie McGee and Sonny Terry and Gary Davis and me to come to his folk club. Obviously, you know, it meant it was great for him to be able to show off his folk club, and here's. Brownie McGinn, Sonny Terry, and Gary yeah. Davis, you know. And so word spread, and the place got packed with people. And they usually had, you know, white English blues singers. And, you know, all of a sudden, here was the real thing. So it was all, people were kind of in the doorway, craning, you know, trying to stare and see if they could see Brownie McGee. And then he played a couple of songs, and then, you know. And I had to go out to the toilet. And I pushed past these people, and then I came back, and I saw this guy standing in the door, kind of trying to see. And I just, I, I couldn't, I, you know, I was completely dumbfounded because he had these white boots on, and he had this like white trench coat, you know, sort of tied tightly at the waist with a belt, and his hair was all bouffant, you know. And at first, I thought, is that a guy or a girl? You know, I was sort of... Not sure. And, uh, and he, was, he just looked extraordinary. And I'd never seen anybody look like that. You know, he just... I just said, which is ironic, knowing when you get to the punchline, that I thought, well, obviously he's, um, he's a homosexual, you know. And, you know, because you were very primitive times in America in 1964. You know, there wasn't a lot of that. I mean, you know, I was very open and liberal about that kind of thing. But it was sort of still a shock to see somebody being flamboyantly feminine, you know. And so when I got in, I, I to back to my seat next to the guy who ran the club. I kind of pointed at the guy in the doorway. I said, wow, look at that guy. You know, who is that guy? He said, oh, he's a good blues singer. His name's Rod Stewart. Oh, wow. There you go. <laughs> and uh, so I remember the name, you know. And it took me a while to kind of get used to the, the fact that in Britain, re rebelliousness and revolution was represented by fashion. Whether you're mod, whether you're, you know, whatever way, yeah. way you wanted to go, it was flamboyant dress, you know. 
And in a way, that was part of what shocked people about Dylan in America in 65, was in this whole sea of denim. You know, Dylan sent a signal that he wasn't going to play by the rules, because when he arrived on a Saturday afternoon, he was wearing this ridiculous polka dot puff sleeve shirt that he'd got in some Greenwich Village boutique, you know. And he was saying, I'm not, in a den I'm not a denim guy anymore. And that was, in a way, the beginning of all that color and flamboyance that, you know, took over America in the late 60s. But that was one of the first things that was hard for me to get used to. Yeah. I think Hendrix was already considered a freak in New York before he came to England. Right. You know, he um, he was considered a weirdo because of the way he dressed, because of his whole attitude, his the way the kind of music he played, because he worked. You know, he, he made his money by working with R and B bands. He played with the Isley Brothers and stuff like that. And they all didn't know what to make of him and how to deal with him because he would take these crazy guitar solos and he'd dress funny and he, you know. So he was already out there. I don't think he needed to come to England to get. Okay. Yeah. I think he took, you know, he saw what was going on here and he loved going down Portobello Road yeah. and buying, you know, yeah, grenadier yeah. jackets and dressing up that way. But he was already dressing up, I think, before he left New York. Yeah. There weren't, there weren't really dilemmas about race with jazz bands from America. Mm -hmm. uh, the racism that I encountered here was later, in the late 60s, with, um, I worked with a South African band um, called the Blue Notes, which was the first multiracial band from South Africa. And initially, when they first arrived here, they had two white players and four black South Africans. And they played a week, I think, at Ronnie Scott's after the Antibes Jazz Festival, and they just left South Africa for the first time. And basically, the South Africans didn't want them back. You know, they were going to have a hard time coming back to South Africa. And uh, um, and when they played the week at Ronnie Scott's, everybody thought they were great. And then they said, oh, this is nice. Let's stay here. So they settled in London. Mm -hmm. And immediately the atmosphere changed. It became very, very difficult for them. And I think that as long as they were exotic visitors, they were welcome. But as soon as they were staying here, and a lot of the girls that hang around Ronnie Scott's adored them, you know, and they loved these guys. And a lot of the white jazz musicians were kind of freaked out by that, I think, and um, there was jealousy, and they, because they, in a way, you know, I think the jazz, a lot of jazz musicians in Britain at that time were, to them, the only thing to do if you're a jazz musician was to play like the Americans, and these guys had a way which was very influenced by American jazz, but was very South African, and they were bringing their own culture into the music in a really free and creative way. And I think a lot of British musicians, jazz musicians, were very f upset and unnerved by this because it was something that they couldn't do in a way. It's like, you know, Morris dance jazz doesn't have quite the same ring, you know, as township jazz, you know, from South Africa. And, uh, and so I think there was a lot of jealousy. And, there, and you know, it's just like, you know, as long as you were a visiting black person, you could be a hero. Mm. But you were going to leave. You know? And when you settled in and you were there week in and week out, you know, the union gave them a terrible time. You know, uh, made them, in order to, um, they couldn't get their union card for a year. They had to be resident for a year before they could get their union card. So basically they had to spend a year not working. How is that possible? You know, and uh, these were refugees from apartheid. You know, so 
and the union was supposed to be solidarity with South African workers and all this kind of thing. And they were doing benefits for anti-apartheid benefits and stuff like that. But when the South Africans were actually on their doorstep, they were just very hard ass really about it. Mm -hmm. So, but you know, generally, I think uh, you know most black American musicians found Europe to be much more relaxed than America for them. Oh.